if uh, <clears throat> if we get the people that are in the back talking to come in or come in. <laughs> Thank you to all who have contributed to our, our fundraising this uh, uh, today and leading to today. Our goal was to um, get to at least 20,000 uh, plus the matching uh, gift that has been promised. Uh, up to today, we have received $25,890. So really excited about that. Thank you. For that, and um, you know, it still has the opportunity all the way through April to, to contribute this cause, and uh, our, our donor is matching each dollar that comes in uh, there. So really appreciative of your generosity. We're going to sing hymn 111 in your hymnal. 111, and then after we sing, Pastor Dr. Lynn Pine, who is our professor. Uh, a homiletics, homiletics professor will come and lead us in prayer. 111, if you're able, would you stand as we sing, This Is My Father's World. please. Lord God, how thankful we are for the privilege of singing to you, of delighting in this creation that you have gloriously provided for us. And we thank you, Father, that in spite of the, the efforts of men to wrestle at, with truths that are beyond us, often failing miserably, yet we thank you, Lord God, that your revelation is sure and certain and not a word shall fall to the ground, but that it will accomplish all that you mean for it to accomplish. We thank you for the encouragement that we have thus far received over the last two evenings, and we look forward now to this final lecture where we will truly be uh, able to put all these things together and come away marveling at your providence your majesty, your wisdom, and, your, and your, your power. Lord God, help us to walk humbly in your presence with hearts full of rejoicing. We pray for Dr. Gibson as he wraps up now this last lecture. Give him clarity of mind and expression and encourage his heart by our engagement with him as he speaks. 
In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If the first lecture was instructive, looking at the literary framework interpretation and its main arguments, and the second and the third lectures were deconstructive, the good news is this final lecture is constructive, or we might say reconstructive, as I hope to present a better way to read the Genesis prologue. You might want to have your Bibles open at Genesis 1 as I go through this lecture to just glance down at a few things in the text. Let me begin with a quote from Francis Schaeffer, a man in your own church denominational history, I believe. Uh, he is the founder of the International Presbyterian Church in, who, in which I am ordained. In his book, Genesis and Time, Francis Schaeffer writes, space and time are like warp and woof. They're interwoven relationship." is history. This is no more true than when it comes to the prologue of the Christian scriptures, Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3. In it, we are presented with created space, the heavens and the earth, and ordered time, a seven-day week with a climactic Sabbath. According to Schaefer, when these two realities, space and time, intersect, we get history, the history of of the world. More specifically and theologically, world history is the interweaving of holy space and holy time under the providence of a holy God. The history of the world begins with holy bounded space, the created heavens and earth and the Garden of Eden, in relation to holy time, the creational Sabbath. And it continues with holy bounded space, the land of Canaan, in relation to holy time, the ceremonial Sabbath, finally consummating with holy bounded space, the new heavens and the new earth, in relation to holy time, the eternal Sabbath. For the purposes of this lecture, I'm going to focus on the divinely ordered Sabbath in relation to the divinely created heavens and earth as an integral component to the unfolding history of the world. The Genesis prologue presents us with two protological realities that God creates in the beginning, space and time. Now, what do I mean by protological? Okay, um, It comes from the word protology, which means the study of or origin, sorry, the study of origins or first things. So protology refers to first things. So what we're going to look at is the protological realities of space and time, the first space that God created and the first time that God inaugurated. In the beginning, God creates two protological realities. He creates the heavens and the earth, protological space, and he creates a cyclical seven-day week with a climactic Sabbath, protological time. The first reality is holy space. The second reality is holy time. The first is the created theater in which history plays out. The second is the ordered timeline along which history unfolds. And I want to spend most of the time thinking about the protological time of the Sabbath day. But we're going to begin with a brief overview of protological space, God's holy space. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. His initial act of creation, ex nihilo, from nothing, produces two physical realities, the heavens and the earth. Let's look at each of these in turn, the heavens. What are these heavens of Genesis 1.1? 
A careful reading of the prologue reveals that heavens, shamayim in the Hebrew, does not always have the same referent. In the prologue, it refers to two distinct but related heavens, the sky space heavens and the supreme heavens. In the beginning, on the first day, God creates the heavens. These are the supernatural, invisible, supreme heavens. On the second day, following the creation of the supreme heavens, God creates another heavenly realm. If you look at chapter 1, verse 6, he creates an expanse, rakia in the Hebrew, in the midst of the waters. And look what he calls the expanse. He calls the expanse heaven, Shemaim. On the fourth day, the two great lights of the sun and the moon and the stars are placed into the expanse of these heavens. These are the natural, visible sky space heavens with two regions, the lower sky heavens and the upper space heavens. The sky heavens are visible from the earth. That's what we look up and see the blue sky, while the space heavens are beyond the regions of this earth, what we would call space or outer space, where the sun and the moon are placed. On the fifth day, the sky space heavens are mentioned again, chapter 1, verse 20, when God creates the birds and he commands the birds to fly across the expanse of the heavens. That is, the lower regions of the heavens, because the birds don't fly up with the moon right, and the stars. They're not up in the upper regions of the heavens. They're in the lower regions of the heavens. Now, given the flow of the prologue, these heavens of day two are distinct from the heavens created in Genesis 1-1 on day one. The Genesis prologue does not explain what the first created heavens are, except to distinguish them from the natural, visible sky space heavens created on day two. However, while the heavens of chapter 1 1 are distinct from the heavens of 1 8, the employment of the common term for both, Shamayim, in each case, communicates that they are related. Indeed, the relation is the location. They are up there, above the natural, visible space heavens that is, the supreme heavens. And there are two biblical texts that speak about these heavens. There's many, but let me mention two. Isaiah 66, thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you will build for me and what is the place of my rest? So Isaiah speaks about the invisible, supernatural, supreme heavens where God dwells on his throne. They are not the same as the sky space heavens, which the birds fly across and the sun and the moon are placed in. Nehemiah 9, 6. You are the Lord, you alone. You made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the angels, the cherubim, the seraphim, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. So Nehemiah speaks of God dwelling in the supernatural, invisible, supreme heavens where the angels worship him. Now, since these heavens are the dwelling place of God, let's call them the supreme heavens. This is uh, what we mean by the heaven of heavens, 1 Kings 8. The heaven of heavens cannot contain you. These are the supreme heavens. So Genesis chapter 1 presents us with two Heavens, a supernatural, invisible, supreme heavens, distinct from but related to the natural, visible sky space heavens. Now, these supreme heavens are not an eternal realm that God has always dwelt in. As I mentioned earlier, if they were, then they would be of equal status with God, eternal in themselves. No, these heavens were created by God in the beginning on day one. And although God has chosen to dwell in these heavens, he existed before and outside of these heavens since he is eternal and infinite. 
So in the beginning, God created the supernatural, invisible realm that he then chose to condescend to live in. This is where he dwells. This is where he is worshipped by the heavenly hosts. These are the heavens that he made in the beginning. But he also made a second physical reality in the beginning. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, just as the heavens have two realms in, in the prologue, the invisible heavens, the supreme heavens, and the visible sky space heavens, so the earth has two realms, land and sea. God creates the earth on day one. It's a globe covered in water. On day three, he gathers the waters into seas and the dry land appears. These are the two realms on the earth, the land and the sea. So do you see the two protological spaces, the two protological realities that God makes in the beginning? He makes the heavens, the invisible heavens, and he makes the earth. The heavens, the invisible heavens, are matched or, or uh, imaged by the visible sky space heavens, which are part of the earth, the cosmos. So we have two realms, the heavens and the earth. Now at this point, let me draw a preliminary observation. In the beginning, God created the supreme heavens and filled them with a host of heavenly creatures to worship him day and night. The same is true with respect to the earth. In the beginning, God made the earth and filled the two main spheres of the earth, land and sea, with living creatures, birds, fish, creeping things. Psalm 148, and Psalm 148 informs us that they, the living creatures on the earth, along with the whole of created order, are made to praise the Lord. So this analysis of the holy space of the heavens and the earth created by God in the beginning reveals how the history of the world begins. World history begins with a holy God in his holy space of the heavens and the earth, being worshipped by angels above and creatures below. World history begins like that. And it continues in the same protological space of the sky space heavens and the supreme heavens and the sea, land, earth below. God still rules from his throne in the supreme heavens with the sea, land, earth as his footstool. We still live and move on the same sea, land, earth under the same sky, space, heavens in which the birds fly in the lower regions and the luminaries of sun, moon, and stars shine in the upper regions. With respect to protological space, nothing has changed since the beginning of creation. We still live in the same world that God created in Genesis 1. With some nuance, we could say the same about the protological time that God created. Which brings me to the second protological reality, holy time. The first is holy space that God made in the beginning, two realms, the heavens and the earth. Now, holy time. In the beginning, God created a cycle of seven days in a week with a climactic Sabbath. How the space heavens and earth interact with protological time makes up the warp and woof of history, as Schaefer claimed. Holy space and holy time interweaving under the providence of a holy God. Now, for the rest of this lecture, we're going to look at this topic of protological time uh, with respect to the Sabbath. And what we see are seven things or what I want you to see are seven things about uh, the Sabbath. Number one, the Sabbath as chronological. In the beginning, God creates a cyclical seven-day week with a climactic sabbatical seventh day. Precisely because, the sa se precisely because the Sabbath is the seventh day of the week, it is chronological. But there are other factors in the Genesis prologue 
that shows us the chronological nature of this chapter and of the Sabbath. First, there is the beginning of time, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is not only the beginning of the heavens and the earth, this is also the beginning of time. Second, there are the alternating periods of time, daytime and nighttime. These two periods make up the first day and every other day afterward. Third, there are the boundaries of time, and there was evening and there was morning. The phrase is repeated six times for each of the first six days. Now, it could be a way of speaking about the end points of the main periods of a day. And there was evening, ends the daytime, and there was morning, ends the nighttime. Or the phrase could be a way of speaking about the beginning points of the main periods of a day. And there was evening, the beginning of a day, and there was morning, the continuation of that day. Now, the Jews began their day in the evening, Leviticus 23, 32. From evening to evening, you will observe the Sabbath, with morning being a continuation of the day. I think the latter interpretation is favorable, the Jewish one, since this is the order of time for the Jewish calendar under the first age of the world. <clears throat> and you see that even around the Passion Week, where the days are marked with the Sabbath in the evening beginning the day. But however you interpret that phrase, the evening and the morning, we see the rhythmic boundaries of time sounding all the way through the prologue. The fourth, there are the markers of time. Sun and moon are created to mark time. It's interesting that in chapter 1, 14 to 18, there are five purpose clauses given to marking time with respect to the sun and the moon, and only two with respect to giving light. The primary purpose of the sun and the moon is to mark time, not to give light. They do give light, but their primary purpose is to mark time. A fifth, there are the registers of time. There are seven in total, the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day, the seventh day. And notice they are ordinal numbers, not cardinal numbers. It doesn't say day one, day two, day three, day four. It says the first day, the second day, the third day, which conveys chronology. Okay? It does not allow for a temporal framework of matching days to days. Sixth, there is the climax of time. We see this on day six with the creation of man. And in the Hebrew, a definite article, the word the is put on uh, the sixth day, which is different to days one to five. It just says first day, second day, third day. When it comes to the sixth day, it says the sixth day. And so it gives the sense of climax there. And it does the same with the seventh day as well in chapter two. And the seventh day is climactic because it's the last day of the creation week. And it's the only day that receives blessing and consecration from God compared to all the other days. So we can see that the, uh, the climax of time in the creation uh, week. So with all those temporal indicators of time, we see chronology effused through the Genesis prologue, uh, climaxing with the Sabbath. So the Sabbath is chronological. It is the end of God's creation week. That's the first thing. Sabbath as chronological. Second, the Sabbath as literal. It's a literal 24-hour day Sabbath. Now, some people like to say, well, Genesis 1, it's a highly stylized piece of literature. It's very poetic. You've got the rhythm of the same phrases being repeated in each day. Uh, so is this really history? Is this not more like poetry? Well, I won't go into all the features of Hebrew poetry, but one of the key features is parallelism, which you see in the Psalms or in the Proverbs. Uh, and there is no parallelism here in Genesis 1. And the, the Hebrew is distinctly prose. It's, it's historical narrative. Uh, so there's no hint that, there, that this is just symbolic language. It, it is conveyed as real history in the Hebrew. Now, the word day 
in Genesis 3, uh, sorry, in Genesis 1 to 2, 4, uh, can have three meanings. The Hebrew word is yom. In Genesis 1, 5, and God called the light day, the first use of the word yom in Genesis is daytime, so less than 24 hours, okay? Uh, chapter 2, verse 4, it's used again, in the day that the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. That is in the moment, in the event. So yom can be used to refer to daytime, less than 24 hours, and it can be used to refer to a moment in time. And it was Augustine who read Genesis 2, 4 and said, there you go, it's instantaneous. In a day, in a moment, God made the heavens, the earth, and all that is in them. So hence Augustine's instantaneous view. Uh, the third way to read the word day is as an ordinary day, 24 hours, and that's the use, the first day, the second day, the third day. And that's the most natural way to read the days of creation because it has an ordinal number, first, second, third, fourth, in a week, and it is accompanied by the phrase, and there was evening and there was morning. And so the most natural way to read the first day is as a first ordinary day. Okay. So when it comes to the Sabbath day, it also should be read as a literal day. Uh, a few things that support this. Um, the number of occurrences of Yom in the Pentateuch with the adjective, with a numeral, numerical adjective, uh, always refer to an, a literal day, and so Genesis 1 would be the only exception. Uh, Moses' allusion back to Genesis 1 in Exodus 20 with the fourth commandment seems to support the idea of reading them as ordinary days. And then the fourth argument would be back to my case against the literary framework interpretation and all other alternative interpretations is they are unable to give an explanation for the origination of the ordinary day, the ordinary week, the ordinary Sabbath. If the first week of creation was divine time, heavenly time, upper register time, when did lower register time begin? If not in that creation week. Um, and fifth, Jesus, when he's speaking about the Sabbath in Mark chapter 2, he says the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. He's speaking in the context of the weekly Sabbath, the ordinary Sabbath, not the eternal Sabbath that God had entered into. And, um, and Jesus is affirming that the Sabbath is an ordinary, literal day of the week. But his allusion is back to creation. The Sabbath was not made for man, but man for the Sabbath. He's alluding back to Genesis 1 and 2, 1 to 3. And he understands it as a literal day, not as an eternal day that just goes on forever. So for those reasons, the Sabbath should be viewed and read as a literal day. Number three, the Sabbath as redemptive historical. I mentioned that the protological space of the heavens and the earth is the theater in which history plays out. And protological time is the timeline on along which history unfolds. Recall Schaeffer's comment, space and time are the warp and woof. Their interwoven relationship is history. And this is especially so when it comes to redemptive history. God's plan of redemption plays out in the physical theater realm of the heavens and the earth and within the temporal realm of the cyclical seven-day week with a climactic Sabbath. For those theological students and faculty here, soteriology maps on to protology. If you didn't understand that as a layperson, don't worry, you didn't miss anything. Okay, but the, the theological students love terms like that. Soteriology maps on to protology. Okay, redemptive history maps onto and plays out in normal historical history. Okay, and you can see this uh, at different parts in the Bible, the flood narrative. The flood narrative works in three one-week cycles when, God, uh, when Noah sends the bird out for seven days. Then he sends it out again for another seven days, sends it out again for another seven days. Right? So the flood narrative is based on the ordinary week being already in existence. And we can do that with the life of Christ as well. 
I mentioned some of these in the last lecture, but let me go into a bit more detail here. With respect to his circumcision, Christ receives the sign of the eternal covenant on the eighth day in accordance with the Abrahamic covenant. Being performed on the eighth day points to a new beginning because the eighth day was the first day of a new week. That's the sort of symbolism with the eighth day. With respect to his death, Christ dies on a Friday, the same day of the week on which Adam was created. Now, some believe that Adam was created on day five, Friday, and he sinned on day five. So think about that. Christ dies on the same day Adam was created and sinned. Now, we don't know what day Adam sinned on. I actually think he did sin on Friday. You can maybe ask a question in the Q&A on that one. Uh, but he was created on the Friday. And Irenaeus, an early church father, said that Christ died to recreate mankind on the day that mankind was created. And so there's rich symbolism here, that Christ dies on a Friday. He dies on the last day of a working week, according to the cycle of time established in the first dispensation of the world. He dies on the sixth day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the day of preparation when the people ate the Passover meal. He dies at three o'clock on the Friday afternoon, the time of the evening sacrifice. And what does he cry out? in the last quarter of the last day of a working week. What are his last words? It is finished. You see the rich symbolism now of redemption mapping on to the ordinary literal week? Okay. With respect to his burial, Christ is buried toward the end of the last day of the working week, the evening of the Sabbath, just before the Sabbath, and then he lies buried in his grave over the Passover Sabbath. We could say he keeps the Sabbath in his death. He rests from his work. So he's keeping the Sabbath even in his death. Uh, and he sleeps through the Sabbath and rises, not on the Sabbath. He rises the day after the Sabbath, which is the eighth day, which is the first day of a new week, and what in the creation week occurred on the first day? The creation and light. And so in his resurrection, he is being resurrected on the same day of the week as the creation began. In other words, in his resurrection, we have a new creation. So do you see how redemption maps on to the ordinary week? And if you don't but when did the ordinary week begin? Well, according to literary framework interpreters, ex nihilo, ex nowhere. But if you are a literal interpreter, the ordinary week began in the creation week, and redemption history maps onto it. Um, uh, Pentecost occurs 50 days after the Passover Sabbath, 49, 7 into 7, 7 times 7, 7 weeks plus 1 is Pentecost occurs 7 weeks plus 1 after the Passover Sabbath when Jesus was sleeping in the grave. And so Pentecost occurs on a Sunday. It occurs on the first day of the week. The Spirit was given on the first day of the week. What was going on in Genesis 1 on the first day of the week with the Spirit? The Spirit was hovering over the deep waters on the first day of the week. Well, the Spirit... At Pentecost is hovering over the earth and is poured out by Christ uh, on the first day of a new week. In sum, Jesus' death on the Friday is the Passover sacrifice to end all Passovers. His sleeping and death on the Saturday is the Sabbath rest to end all Sabbaths. And his resurrection on the Sunday, the first day of a new week, the eighth day, serves to confirm that the old is gone, the new has come. Jesus, we could say, disposes of the first age of the world. And then, by rising on the Sunday, the first day of a new week, he inaugurates the second age of the world. And all of this is because the resurrection occurs one whole day, one whole week, one whole age 
removed from the last Sabbath of the first age of the world. This distancing from the Sabbath of the first world order is made clear by how the New Testament writers refer to the day on which Jesus rose from the dead. They all say, on the first day of the week, which in Greek, meaton, sabbaton, means literally one day removed from the Sabbath. That's how you say the first day of the week in Greek. One day removed from the Sabbath. So in the New Age, um, the day of rest, of observance, of holy convocation, it's no longer the last day of the week, it's the first day of the week. And Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week, one day, one week, one age removed from the old age of the, of the world. So you can see how the events surrounding Christ's circumcision, his death, his burial, his resurrection and ascension, the drama of redemptive history in those events plays out within the framework of protological time, of the cyclical seven-day week within a, with a climactic Sabbath. And when was that cyclical seven-day week with a climactic Sabbath established? At creation. But if you hold to an alternative view of creation, of the days of creation, you have to say, well, we don't know when lower register time began. It just did begin. Okay, so we've seen three things about the Sabbath as chronological, literal, and as redemptive historical. Redemption plays out in the time frame of the ordinary week with the Sabbath as its climax. Number four, the Sabbath as typological. The Sabbath as typological. The Sabbath is not only chronological and literal, but it also serves as a type. That is, the Sabbath points beyond itself to another reality. Now, in the Old Testament, for something to constitute a type, it had to uh, meet certain characteristics. It had to display five characteristics. Here they were. It had to be historical. The type must be a person, place, ordinance, institution, event in real history. Second, it had to be theological. It had to be connected to some part of God's redemptive dealings with humanity. Third, it had to be symbolical. The type had to symbolize or signify something. Fourth, it had to be analogical. The type must correspond significantly to some anti-type in the New Testament. It had to have an, an analog. It had to have something that it was connected to in the New Testament. And then the fifth characteristic of typology, the type had to undergo some higher development in the New Testament. It had to escalate in its uh, reality. And the Sabbath day meets all of these requirements. Being a protological reality in the creation week, it has an historical reality to it. It is the climactic day of the cyclical seven-day week. And by historical, I don't mean heavenly history, I mean earthly history, right? Types had to have historical reality on earth, not in heaven. Uh, second, the day is theological in that it is blessed by God, sanctified by God to be a day of rest and worship for his people. Third, the day symbolizes a period of rest physically and spiritually. Fourth, in the New Testament, the day finds its analog in the future rest in heaven. And fifth, there's escalation. The day of the Sabbath in the Old Testament is a limited temporary period of time within a week. What does it point to? It points to the eternal permanent period of rest in heaven. So temporary rest on earth gets escalated to permanent rest in heaven. So the Sabbath meets all the requirements of a type. The Sabbath is typological. But notice that one of the features of it being a type, in order to qualify as a type, it has to be historical, it has to be literal, it has to be a real day. It can't be a heavenly day. Okay? It has to be a real thing on the earth in lower register time. And so it qualifies uh, for that. Now, 
With the Sabbath, we need to avoid a hermeneutical misstep. Uh, Literary framework interpreters and analogical interpreters point out that there is no mention of evening and morning in chapter 2, verse 1 to 3, with respect to the Sabbath. Did you notice that? For six days, we're told, and there was evening and there was morning. The first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, there was evening and there was morning. There was evening and there was morning. But when it comes to the seventh day in chapter 2, verse 1 to 3, there's no mention of, and there was evening and there was morning. And so those who don't take Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3 literally say, there you go, the Sabbath cannot be literal because there was no evening and no morning to it. Okay? And what I want to say is I think that's overstating the case. Yes, there is no evening and no morning mentioned. Why? Uh, Because it is a type, a real day symbolizing the eternal rest of God. Let me give an illustration that may help here. Uh, So the non-literal interpreters say the Sabbath day is not a real day. It's not an ordinary day. It is an eternal day in the narrative because there's no evening and there's no morning. Do you get that? The Sabbath, you have six ordinary days. The seventh day is an eternal day. But really what the literal interpreters believe is that on the seventh day, which was an ordinary literal day, God entered his eternal rest. And hence why there's no mention of evening and morning, not because there was no evening and morning, but the narrative drops it to show that it's being symbolic of God's eternal rest. So let me give you an illustration to make the point. Imagine a person who has worked their whole life in a particular job, and then after 40 years, one Friday afternoon, they finish work for the last time and enter their retirement. Maybe some of you have had that experience. That weekend is a very different weekend for them than everyone else in the same company. We might say that that person's weekend never ends, okay? Because they have entered the rest of their retirement. However, on Monday morning, Monday rolls around for the rest of the workers in the company just as it always did. They all go back to work on Monday, while the person who has retired just continues with their weekend. Okay? In both cases, the weekly cycle continues as it always does for the retired person and for the worker who's still at work. The weekly cycle has not changed. It's just that the person who on that Friday afternoon entered their retirement just never came back to work. But the cycle of the week just continues. Well, so it is with God. On the first Sabbath day at the end of the creation week, God entered his rest. But the next day, a week rolled around for Adam and Eve, and they had to get into the garden and get to work. But for God, he had entered his permanent retirement on that particular Sabbath and never returned to work again. Why? Because the creation was finished. So God's rest is eternal, but that does not mean that the day on which he began his eternal rest is eternal. Voss puts it simply, although God's Sabbath is certainly endless, that cannot be said of the first Sabbath after the six-day creation for mankind. In short, we shouldn't pit the typological nature of the Sabbath against the literal nature of the Sabbath. So that's the fourth thing about the Sabbath. It's typological. Number five, the Sabbath as eschatological. Now, that's a big word. All I mean by that is the Sabbath relates to the last days, to the eternal uh, day uh, in the new heavens and the new earth. And as I mentioned, we get this hint of the Sabbath being typological and eschatological because of the dropping of the phrase, there was evening and there was morning. The Sabbath serves as a type of the rest to come, and that rest is the eternal life. And therefore, the Sabbath is eschatological as well as typological. Now, in considering the Sabbath as redemptive historical, typological, and eschatological, discussion of its fulfillment naturally comes into play, which brings us to the sixth observation on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is chronological, literal, redemptive historical, typological, eschatological, 
Number six. Remember, there's seven, seven days in a week. Okay, number six, the Sabbath as Christological. Since the Sabbath is redemptive, historical, and typological, it is necessarily Christological. At one level, this means that the Sabbath day is fulfilled in Christ, the great harbinger of eternal rest. In his person and work, Christ brings blessing and rest from the curse and unrest of sin. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So Christ is the Sabbath, right? Christ brings us the rest from sin and judgment that we've been looking for. However, it would be overly simplistic to think that this is all there is to say about the fulfillment of the Sabbath by Christ, because the writer of Hebrews indicates that it is not as simple as making a one-dimensional type to anti-type connection between the Sabbath and Christ. I was trained at Moore Theological College in Sydney, and they love to say in the Sydney Diocese, um, Christ has fulfilled the Sabbath. Every day is the Lord's day now, because Christ has fulfilled the Sabbath. Uh, but what I've come to see is in Hebrews chapter 4, 8 to 10, the writer says, there yet remains a Sabbath for the people of God. There yet remains a Sabbath for the people of God, which means that the typo typological has not yet become the eschatological. And if so, then the typological remains, and if the type remains, then the Sabbath remains as a type of the future eternal rest. So although it is right to say that Christ fulfills the Sabbath in his person at work, this does not mean that the type has become obsolete. Rather, the type of the Sabbath has undergone a change. The sign of the eternal rest has changed from being the last day of the week to being the first day of the week. It's changed from being called the Jewish Sabbath to being called the Christian Sabbath or the Lord's Day. And this is what we see with uh, the resurrection accounts. Every gospel writer tells us that it was on the first day of the week that they went to the tomb and that Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week. Remember what the Greek is? One day removed from the Sabbath. That's showing us the change. The sign of God's eternal rest in the normal week is no longer the last day of the week, the Sabbath. It is now the Lord's day, the first day of the week. And we can see this also in Jesus' last day uh, of his life and also the first day of his resurrection. Think about what happens in protological space in Jesus' death and resurrection. As he hangs on the cross as the second and last Adam, naked like Adam was uh, before he sinned, with a crown of thorns on his head bearing the curse of Adam, as he hangs suspended between the space of the earth and the heavens, what happens? There's an earthquake. The new creation is breaking into the old creation. And what happens at his resurrection? Another earthquake. The new creation is breaking out through the old creation of the protological space of the heavens and the earth. Think about what happens on the cross in the heavens, the sky space heavens. What happens? The sun is blanked out. Light doesn't work normally anymore. The old age of the space, heavens, and earth is passing away. The new age of the eternal heavens and the earth is breaking forth in Christ's death and resurrection. And it's the same with time. The Sabbath is put to bed. Or as Gerhardus Voss puts it beautifully, Jesus left the Sabbath in the grave and rose on the first day of a new week. The Sabbath, the Jewish Sabbath, has been retired when Jesus rose from the dead. It is not that there is no sign of the eternal rest. There is still the sign, 
The sign has undergone a change. It's no longer the Sabbath, the last day of the week. It's now the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. So the Sabbath is um, Christological. Christ fulfills the Sabbath, but also we're waiting for Christ's return for us to enter that uh, eternal Sabbath. So that's the sixth one, the Sabbath as Christological. And then finally, the Sabbath as practical. This point touches on the question of whether we should keep the Sabbath today. And the answer is no and yes. We do not keep the Jewish Sabbath today because Jesus left it in the grave when he rose on the first day of a new week. Do we keep the Sabbath today? Yes, as the Lord's Day, the first day of a new week. And so for the reasons we've already seen, the Sabbath is in perpetuity. It still continues. It's protological. It is part of protological time at the beginning. It is a created order. Uh, it is a created ordinance, not a ceremonial ordinance. Jesus, sorry, Moses, God through Moses at Sinai says, remember the Sabbath. He doesn't say, let me introduce you to the Sabbath as a ceremonial law for you as a nation called Israel. No, he says, remember the Sabbath. And then what does he take them back to? Creation. So the Sabbath is a creation ordinance, and that's why it continues today in uh, the protological time of the ordinary week. Uh, the Sabbath is typological and eschatological, and because the eternal rest hasn't happened yet, as the writer of Hebrews says, there yet remains a Sabbath. And if there yet remains a Sabbath, the type remains which means we need to have a type today to point us to the eternal rest, and that is the Lord's Day. And then the Sabbath is redemptive, historical, and Christological. Uh, Jesus has inaugurated a new day for rest and worship, and that day is the Lord's Day. Well, that's the seven things we've seen about the Sabbath. Chronological, literal, redemptive, historical, typological, uh, eschatological, Christological, and practical. That's the seventh one. Practical. The Sabbath is still to be kept today. Not as the last day of the week, but as the first day of the week. So, in closing, let me return to the quote by Francis Schaeffer with which this, chap with which this lecture began. Space and time are like warp and woof. Their interwoven relationship is history. Understanding what history is, the warp and woof of holy space and holy time under the providence of a holy God helps us to grasp the significance of our weekly worship. When we gather as a church each Lord's Day in a bounded holy space on earth, to worship God along with saints and angels in heaven, we are making history. Indeed, we are proclaiming to the world that one day all history will be church history, and it is time for people to get on the right side of history. For this is what the history of the world is all about. A holy God in his holy space of the heavens and the earth being worshipped by angels above and creatures below as he brings his creation into his holy time of Sabbath rest. And if that is so, then let us come and worship God on his appointed day. Just a couple of questions late at night, and we want to get to the Sabbath tomorrow, and, but not here, yeah. right? We're going to go home and then come back. Uh, uh, yesterday, in one of your lectures, you stated that in proper hermeneutics, you must take into account who the author was and what was written first. In regard to the, that principle, which do you believe came first, Job or Genesis? How does that affect our interpretation of Genesis 1, especially with terms like the deep, which appears in Genesis 1-2, and also in several places in Job, like in Job 38-30? 
It's a student, and then he had another question that's probably a paper he has to write, so I'm not going to ask that one. Okay. Um, so the question is really saying, did, is, Mo, did, is Genesis the first book that was written down in history? And I think if I'm understanding the question... Yeah, and how does it apply, uh, affect our hermeneutics? How does it affect our hermeneutics? Could Job have been the first book written down before Moses? Correct. Um, I would say, yes, it could have been, may well have been. Job, I think, is early. But just because it was first written down... Uh, it is not the first book in the canon of Scripture. If God wanted us to read Genesis 1 through the lens of Job, I think he would have put Job as the first book of the Bible. But he has put Genesis as the first book in the canon of Christian Scripture. And so even though Job may have been written in time before Genesis, uh, what we have been given is the final form, and we should read it in the order in which it's been given. So does that answer the, the question? I think so. Okay. Um, and then uh, another question. Mm -hmm. If one accepts Iron and Klein's view of creation, not literal and non-sequential, how does this affect Christ's reference to that creational order in the Gospels? Well, I think what I was trying to point out in that lecture is that I think Irons and Klein are in a bit of a muddle as to what Jesus is referring to. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think, as I showed, he's clearly referring to time in the lower register. From the beginning, God made the male and female. The, the man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath mm -hmm. for man. Uh, he's referring to lower register time, which really sort of counters their argument that in the beginning and the Sabbath yeah. are upper register realities. I think the question is then, how would they deal with what Jesus says? I don't know, because okay. uh, they don't actually handle those verses. And, okay. I, and I think in that respect, they hadn't thought of, well, what do we do with these verses? And how do we fit these verses into our uh, framework? And they may well respond, well, no, Jesus is referring to upper register time from the beginning and the Sabbath. And again, my reply to that would be, okay, for the sake of argument, let's accept that. When did Adam and Eve enter lower register time? If they were created in heavenly time, at what point did earthly time become a thing for them? Mm -hmm. And that's where I think all alternative interpretations cannot answer the question about the origination of ordinary time. And just to clarify, because somebody asked this, you are saying that though you, you, there are some helpful things about the upper and lower registries, registers, you are saying that history of heaven and history of Earth, let's call it. There's a time is happening at the same time, uh, 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 alongside with each other, right? It's not like ten minutes in heaven is a minute on earth, or ten minutes on earth is a minute in heaven, sort of thing. I think the three examples I gave: Jacob seeing the angels yeah. climbing, uh, Gabriel telling Daniel, "We heard your prayer from the moment you began to utter it," and Stephen seeing Jesus standing at the right hand of God. These are all happening simultaneously. Uh, heavenly time and earthly time is simultaneous mm -hmm. to each other. Whereas Klein and Irons, I don't think, affirm that. They say it happens at some moment, but they, they're very clear. It is, in days one to five, it's not simultaneous or sequential. The earthly time is not simultaneous and sequential to the heavenly time. I could follow up that then with saying, then shouldn't we take a thousand years as a thousand years? But I'm not going to follow up with that. I'm going to go to another question that's here. It's, uh, uh, the, the person says, it seems that instead of being the queen of sciences, as it was historically known, most modern theological developments are just aping their secular counterparts, i.e. the development of Christian deconstruction after the rise of deconstruction as a philosophical tool. Is this literary framework an ape of some secular project? My answer to that is I don't know. Um, I, I think Irons and Klein are genuinely trying to wrestle with the text as they claim they are, and I, I take them as being authentic and genuine at that point. Uh, and as I said, and you, as you will have heard from my final lecture, 
I agree with upper and lower registers. You know, I think it's mm. hard to get away from it. It's there. And uh, God is in the invisible heavens and he works on the earth. There's two registers, two realms. And there's time. There's time up there and there's time down here. I think the, the confusion and obscurity that Klein have is they just don't talk about how those two times intersect. And I've been arguing that they do intersect and they're in lockstep with each other, simultaneous to each other. All right. <clears throat> um, how would Klein and Irons explain the use of ordinal numbers, if you're aware of that, and do they borrow from the age theory for days one through three? Uh, no, they don't borrow from day age theory. They're actually quite critical of day age theory in the book, The Genesis Debate. They critique it and respond to the proponent of day age theory in that debate. Um, what do they do with ordinal numbers? They say it's irrelevant because they say, we agree that in the narrative, it is the first day, the second day, the third day. They are real ordinal numbers in the narrative. But the narrative is just the earthly garb of the heavenly time. It didn't happen in the heavenly time in that order. It's just being conveyed to us in a way that we think is chronological and sequential. And so, yes, it says first day, second day. And so they say, you know, this argument from the Hebrew about ordinary days having the ordinal numbers is a totally irrelevant because yes in the narrative it says that but that's not how it happened in the history of heaven all right i think that's going to be all the questions we're going to ask tonight do you have a favorite um i think it was my first one uh, the one in the, the last reformation second. no the one before that about heavenly time earthly time the first question you asked me. This yeah, is so we have a problem. That's another student. No, I deleted that question. I don't know who sent it. I just remember okay. it was sent. Okay. Are you here? <laughs> the one who sent that question? Okay. Okay. That's, that's fine. So um, it shows you how bad my memory is these days. What were my questions to, in this last session? How about if we give to a student that asks questions? Is that okay? Okay, but do you know which question? Yes, Ryan, right there. <laughs> yes. And he's the one that wants you to write his paper, too. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, I think he's got to be thy my vision. Uh, you got You have it already? Yeah, so. Okay, so you don't so, need it. No, he doesn't need it. Um, um, let, sorry, the question. Um, the, the question about uh, ordinal numbers. That's a good question. As a graduate from our seminary as okay. well, Chris Stanley, right here. Come and get your book, Chris. Yeah. Right there. <laughs> so yesterday he was sending us messages, but for some reason his messages weren't coming through. They were. So they were coming from. The they were in the register. upper registry. Yeah. <laughs> As, as Irons and Klein would say, they were I, untranslatable yes. in the lower register. From Chris, I don't know if maybe we're coming from an even lower register. I don't know, but yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Uh, pretty basic, yes. Thank you, Dr. Gibson. I really appreciate your uh, taking the time to talk with us. Uh, we can't, it's okay, we can clap for him. Yes. And if you do not attend a church, or if you attend a church that's not proclaiming the gospel, tomorrow here at 10.30, morning service, and if you're really ambitious, Sunday school is at 9.30. So keep that in mind. Let us pray together. Our glorious God, we thank you that you are God who speaks, and you spoke to us about your creation. We thank you that you spoke and things came into existence. We thank you that you gave us an accurate, accurate record of how you did that. Father, we thank you that the Sabbath day is approaching for us tomorrow. We pray that you would prepare our hearts for it, that we might meet with you in a powerful way and with your saints, that we might be able to join the church on earth and in heaven in worshiping the Lamb that was once slain but now lives and reigns over his church. Dismiss us with your blessings. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.